Yeah, let's get started. So uh, welcome to the workshop for Swift Student Challenge um, for this year. Uh, I'm Apollo from the App Development Club at University of Washington. And today we're gonna to discuss what is Swift Student Challenge, why you should participate in it, and how exactly do you do that? Um, right. And there is something new about Swift Student Challenge this year. So if you participate in it before, uh, you do want to consider about the new changes since it will change what you're going to be submitting. And so to understand what Swift Student Challenge is, we need to understand what WWDC is um, because it is part of that. So WWDC is Apple's annual developer conference and they invite developers from around the world and more than just uh, developers, also there are designers and admins that all work on iOS apps. They'll all fly to California when everything's per in person um, to learn about what Apple have made in the past year and how you can utilize those new technologies in your own iOS applications. And as I discussed before, uh, there are sessions that kind of like lectures where they talk about uh, what they made. For example, on the lower left, uh, right corner, we have dark mode when they first introduced it. And then on the left is the technology labs that they have, which is a chance where you can actually talk to Apple engineers, meet with them, show you your code uh, to them and have them help you fix bugs or discuss what's a better approach to things. And there are sometimes fun activities as well. For example, when they first introduced AR kit, uh, they have a room where you can play AR games with others. So, and it's a pretty fun activity and you get a bunch of uh, small prizes as well. So. Uh, despite the expensive ticket price that normal developers have to pay, uh, they still show up no matter what. And then uh, there are the fun parts. Uh, they cover all your food for breakfast and lunch, not dinner. Um, they have a huge kind of um, music bash, um, music concert on Thursday night, uh, where it's kind of end of week and everyone has finished learning. Uh, so it's time to have fun and play games. And Apple engineers can be fun as well. Uh, some of them were dancing at the labs. Um, so yeah. And uh, if you're an Apple fan, um, you'll know their software guy in charge, Craig Federici. Um, and it's kind of fun that uh, we kind of try to find and uh, ask Craig for his signature. Um, but I guess you get a chance to meet with Apple executives such as Craig or Tim Cook and you can take selfies with them or ask them for signatures. Um, kind of cool to tell other people. And Substitute Challenge is uh, Apple's way to provide students a free chance to attend WDC. If it's in person, they're gonna cover uh, your tickets to there. Uh, if you show them that you can cover your tickets yourself. But, and more generally, they'll cover your um, hotel prices. And also you get some exclusive contents. Um, but the thing is you have to submit and participate in this challenge. For this year, what you're gonna make is something called a playground app, uh, which you can write inside uh, both uh, Xcode or on iPad using Swift Playgrounds. Uh, as you can see in the screenshot on the left, you have your code editor. On, on the right, you can see how the app behaves. Uh, so, and you get code completion to help you write your app. So hopefully this should be Apple's way of um, inviting new developers to kind of learn how to code and make their first apps in this kind of easy layout and um, way. And if you do win the challenge, you're gonna get some uh, nice jackets. I didn't wear them today, but um, I do have them. Uh, and you got pins that are magnetic and you can put it on anywhere you want. Uh, these are exclusive to Swift Challenge winners, so you can't really get them from anywhere else. And you also get one year of free Apple developer membership, which really costs you $99 if you want to publish any sort of app from the App Store. And lastly, if it's in person, you also get a chance to potentially visit the Apple Park or have some exclusive opportunities that are only available to Swift Student Challenge winners which is why this is a great opportunity because um, if you are one of the top um, selected students 
you also get a special chance to talk with the press and Apple CEO Tim Cook about your submission. Uh, this is really dedicated to students who really kind of push the boundary of what is possible and help the society. Um, but there is definitely a chance that you could be the next one. All right, so hopefully that has kind of told you what WDC is and why it is a special opportunity. And a quick summary of what's new for Switzerland Challenge this year is that it's due uh, on next Sunday, April 24th at 11 59 p.m. Uh, we strongly encourage you to try to finish up early so you have some time to catch bugs uh, and make some changes. And if you have participated before, you know you will turn in a playground book, but now for this year, you will need to turn in a playground app. In general, playground apps are easier to make, uh, but there are also some restrictions that you uh, want to consider about that's different from playground book. Um, and if you have participated in student challenge before, you can only win it for up to four times in your lifetime. Um, but otherwise, you should be fine. And hopefully you are not a full-time developer because this is intended for students to discover and learn computer science. So it's generally designed for beginners and not someone, let's say, with a bunch of experiences. Um, and for this year, great news, COVID is about to end. So there is a chance that they can invite you to California finally. Uh, it is during finals week, but I think if you tell your teacher you're eating Apple CEO, I think they're going to let you go. Um, and I was going to announce the details too. So uh, the link to apply is on Apple's website, developer.apple.com slash wdc22, and you can navigate to the Swift Spring Challenge pay, uh, page and apply. Uh, we're going to summarize a little bit for you. Uh, so first, you have to be a student uh, above the legal age. Uh, you can invite your friends or uh, if they have young children, students or whatever that want to uh, apply, just let their parents know. Uh, and for this year, you need to submit, submit a playground app uh, because there are so many submissions app limits it to a kind of a small and short app that they can play around with in under three minutes. So it doesn't have to be something that's elaborate. Um, your file shouldn't be too large, um, right? Um, you should contain it to less than 25 megabytes. And there is such restriction because you cannot connect to the network and everything has to be included in your zip file. So you include all the images, JSON files, whatever you need or inside that bundle. And unfortunately, you cannot team up for this challenge. You have to work on this by yourself. Um, and if you do use, let's say, images from the online or third party open source libraries, uh, do remember to cite your sources uh, and don't plagiarize. And in addition to the code part, there are a few essays that that kind of optional, but we strongly encourage you to write uh, because Apple do judge uh, your written submissions as well. The first one is describing what you did inside your playgrounds. Uh, playground app. So first, um, you want to tell the judges what you did in a playground app, and they should know what to expect, and maybe how to interact with your app. And you should talk about what Apple technologies that you use. This is one of the ways that uh, they evaluate your submissions. Um, and again, this can be included in a bullet list. And one thing that I encourage people to include, if space allows, is why you decide to work on this playground. Um, because you know everyone can make any program. Why did you decide to do this one? I think that's something that makes your submission stand apart from other submissions. Next thing is beyond WDC. Uh, this one you should discuss about how you are sharing your knowledge with others in terms of computer science and why you're enthusiastic about it. Uh, some examples include helping your classmates in class or, you know, what I'm doing right now, uh, or if you have contributed other projects online, stuff like that. Um, there can be anything that you can think about, or if you haven't done that yet, you can talk about how you plan to start doing it. Uh, maybe your concrete plans, let's say you have already applied to be a teaching assistant and are you excited to do it next. And this doesn't have to be only related to Apple, I think. If you talk about how you're doing other things since you discovered Apple, that could also work. 
Um, but it will, it will be great if it's related um, or somehow related to Apple, since this is a time hosted by Apple anyways. And there are some optional assets, apps on the App Store, most likely you probably don't have it. Uh, but if you do, you can describe it uh, similar to how you describe your playground. And if you have any other things to discuss, um, or you, if you just have things that didn't fit into the other essays because it has a 350 word limit, it's kind of short. Uh, so this is just another text box for you to fill in other information. All right, uh, that's a boring part. Uh, let's talk about uh, why you should care. Right? Apple judges uh, the things submitted by first technical accomplishments. This basically just means um, what kind of technologies you used um, made by Apple. And preferably, you should be using latest Apple technologies that they introduced uh, hopefully last year or maybe the year before, uh, because they do want to see you learning their new things and how you can benefit from going to WDC this year. Next thing is creativity of ideas in the submitted to Playground app. This thing we generally recommend is your Playground app should be something that's unique to you. And uh, because this is an app and not like a book, uh, it should be interactive and judges should be able to see what you're trying to do with it. And we kind of talk about written responses and essays first because it is one of the three uh, judging criteria. Uh, we will say it probably were, uh, worth at least 33% of your submission, if not 50%. Uh, you can kind of think of it like your college application, right? In addition to your activities and stuff, your essays do come a significant part in your submission. And since I shouldn't do, well, uh, don't cheat and don't play unfair, uh, unfairly. Uh, don't rely on network. Uh, that is um, something that a lot of people miss. Um, and don't submit your previous things and try to leave some time to fix your things up um, because bugs do happen. All right. uh, although you should work on this individually, uh, you hopefully if you have time, you should ask other people to test it out because judges they are, they have never seen your code before and they've never used your app before. Uh, I think seeing how other people react to your submission is a great way to get feedback and modify your submission uh, to help it make more sense. And uh, I guess the final most important part uh, is coding. How do we make a three playground app? Well, uh, before we even started to code, I think we need to figure out what we want to make. Um, there are a few things to help you uh, think about an idea. Um, it should be something that you're interested in and that can show your enthusiasm, right? Uh, let's say I am uh, interested in, uh, I don't know, um, Let's say I'm interested in skiing. I, I can talk about skiing, maybe make an app about skiing, planning for to ski or techniques for skiing, stuff like that. Um, and if you are have a different culture background, you can talk about uh, your language, you can talk about your traditions, you can talk about um, the festivals that you have that other people may not know about, talk about food, um, if you're interested in that. Um, and all of those can be expressed in interactive ways for apps. And that is something to try to um, do is hopefully you can add more interactions. So it's not just like scanning through pages of book because it is apps. Apps should be easy to understand and interactive. Now, if you want to see what previous submissions did, there is a page on GitHub where uh, previous winners and I guess people who didn't get accepted uh, release their source code um, and can uh, help you take a look. Uh, so it's github.com slash WDC. And for every year, there will be a company YouTube playlist for it. Um, and you can watch the videos and see what the submissions are like. Do know that previous years, they submitted something called Playground Book. So it's going to look a little bit different from a Playground app. I think it is beneficial to see what kind of ideas they have made. Uh, maybe not the techniques, but the ideas definitely help. But uh, again, don't copy someone else's idea and kind of make this yours uh, because you do want it to be unique to you. All right. 
And um, something that I cannot cover entirely in today's section, but hopefully you will have some time to learn along the way, or maybe, yeah, is first you need to know the Swift programming language. If you already have prior experience with Swift, there is a quick uh, one page or one web page kind of guide that talks you through the basic fundamentals of Swift. Uh, and if you have pro programming experiences from other programming languages, Swift should be pretty close to Python or Java. It's like a mix of both. Um, so if you have experience with either, this should be easy to pick up. And because you're making an app, you need to make a UI. We strongly encourage you to use Swift UI if you're just making a like 2D application. But if you're more familiar with UI you can do that as well. And if you want to make something that's let's say GAM or 3D, you can use some of the Apple other technologies listed here, such as Sync, Sprite, ARKit, or Reality Kit. Um, and we encourage you to explore what Apple has released from last year, WC21 and WC20. They have a page uh, of all the videos um, that they included for previous years. Take a look at the index, see what might be related to your idea and think about how you can incorporate some of that into your submission. And here are just a few from uh, me glancing through Apple's WC page. You can see a lot of things about ARKit, reality kits. I think that's something Apple is trying to push recently. And if you're interested in data science, we have a tablet data framework that can help you work with CSV files. And we also have things related to, you know, accessibility. I think that's something that Apple also cares a lot. Maybe think about what kind of interesting interactions you can expose through accessibility APIs. Or think about <clears throat> how you can guide the judges uh, through a different experience if they are using accessibility technologies. Um, and so I guess now we can get started with today's uh, demoing part. And today we're going to make a to-do list app because that is something that kind of um, shows you the basics of Swift and Swift UI programming. It involves uh, a lot of the things you might encounter. And we're gonna both demo with um, the Swift Playgrounds app on iPad and the Xcode app on the Mac. So first, uh, let me uh, join the meeting on my iPad so we can show this. Oh, and we can join the meeting right now. Um, let's take a look at iPad. So if you have an iPad, you can download the Swift Playgrounds app. Um, and we can open the Playgrounds app. So this is a user interface for Swift Playgrounds. And if you scroll down a little bit, you're gonna see that we have a lot of choices uh, for the Swift Playgrounds. First section, you can see that Apple has included uh, a bunch of templates from Apple that you can just directly choose from, right? Um, you can take a look and get some inspirations from Apple on how they made their Swift Playgrounds app. But for today, we're just gonna start uh, with the blank app templates on the lower left corner. And after some time, it has been created and we can tap open it. Uh, you can see that on the left, we have the code editor area, and on the right, we have the preview of the app. Um, you can do some uh, additional configurations here. If you tap on this My App icon, you can change what's the name of the app, maybe name it WC22, and that will give you a more descriptive name that you can think about. You can change the sun color. Uh, well, any color would work. Um, pick a one that you like. I don't know, maybe a purple one for you to uh, yeah, you can pick from one of the predefined symbols here. You know, uh, I don't know what exact verb um, here would work. Uh, to-do list, um, well, I guess this look good enough as a to-do list app icon, right? And if you do want to use additional things such as camera, you can add it here, right? If you want to use camera, you can describe uh, to take pictures of people. I don't know. You can configure those. Um, uh, capabilities as well if you do need that and so but basically this is how you would be creating a Swift Playgrounds app on iPad pretty simple and later we're going to show you how exactly um, to write Swift UI but 
basically as you edit the code, you can see the changes on the right in real time. So that's the basics of uh, how to create a script playground app on iPad. Should be pretty simple. All right. And now let's see the demo on Xcode. Xcode, great. Uh, so uh, now we have Xcode. And if you're using Xcode, similarly, you can create a new project uh, that uses the Swift Playground uh, template. Um, and we can start by creating a new Xcode project. So if we go to the create page, we can see that uh, we have multiple platform in iOS. We will be using iOS for this. Um, now we can choose a Swift, Swift Playgrounds app template. And we can click next. Uh, similarly, you have choose team or app name. Again, I'm just gonna name it WC22, but you can name it whatever product name you want to name it. Save the file somewhere and it is done. And then now pretty much we have the same thing. You can configure the app icon and stuff. So um, the main part of the app uh, is this um, my app so, uh, Swift, but most likely we will not be interacting with it. Um, there's also this content view. I think content view is where most people will get started uh, with their things. Um, so the framework we're gonna use is called Swift UI. Uh, it can help you write user interfaces for iOS applications pretty easily. But let's assume we don't really know how to get started. Uh, they already have some sample code to help us, uh, but let's ignore that. So uh, we're making a to-do list application. Um, and I guess the most uh, apparent thing that we probably want to add is the text to display uh, the to-do item content. But uh, what if I don't know how to do that? So there's a little plus icon, either if you're on Playground uh, on iPad or if you're on Xcode, you can plus that. And you can search for views. Views is basically something that you can display um, on your screen. Uh, let's just say maybe text, is it gonna show something? Okay, yes, we do have this text option here. Uh, sure, simulator. Uh, text and it does appear uh, that the document dis uh, describes what we want for text. So let's just insert one here. And right now it says placeholder. Uh, let's just change it to, to do item content for now. Uh, we're gonna replace this with actual content. But And if we hit this resume button or on iPad, it should just refresh automatically. We can see that on the screen on the right, it has updated to show our new things. Um, but uh, let's say I don't like the you know, default color. Um, what if I want to change the text color? Well, maybe let's go to that plus button again. Let's see if we can search something else up. So or we already have the view that displays the content. And if we want to make modifications to it, we use something else called modifier. And again, we can search. Maybe let's see color. Um, we do see a bunch of color modifiers we can use. This one is called foreground color. Sounds about right to me. Uh, and it provided default that has playground, uh, foreground color of blue. Uh, I don't know, maybe we can change it to uh, indigo, I don't know. That's more like a UW color to me. So that's that. Or if you don't want to use the plus button to do it, you can just press the um, some key on the keyboard and Xcode is gonna automatically complete it for you. Uh, let's say uh, we can observe that uh, adding modifier is kind of like calling a function, right? You uh, say dot and you call the function name and give it arguments. So let's assume that we can probably change the font to be uh, you know, a little more bold. Let's try if we have something like that. Uh, let's say font. Okay, um, Xcode has given me some suggestions, such as changing the entire font or maybe just changing the font weight. Okay, um, and bold is uh, available font weight. So I just use the automatic completion. And now we can see that the text is already bold. So yeah, hopefully um, that's some um, basic intro introduction to how kind of you can see things in preview and how you can find some views to use if you don't know what to use and how to modify it uh, if you want to do that.
Now, I think this is a great moment for us to maybe try to run the app in an actual device. No matter if you use an iPad or Xcode, you should be able to press this triangle button and it will bring the app into full screen and run it. So on Xcode, you probably run in a simulator. If you have an M1 Mac, you can run it on your Mac as well. Uh, if you have an iPad, we'll just run it on the iPad. Um, what we're going to see that it behaves basically exactly the same as you can see in the preview, but maybe inside preview, some actions won't happen. Uh, so for example, you have a print statement in there, it's not going to print, but if you do run it, you're going to be able to see it. All right, give it a few seconds. You can see the content is up, so great. Now, uh, I think I just rely on preview for today for the most part um, because it is most convenient for you and it's easy to use. Um, now, I guess the next thing we want inside to do this app is we do want to have ability to check it, right? Uh, we want to have the circle to the left that let us specify if it's selected or not. Uh, but where do I find an icon like that? Well, uh, Apple has an app called SF Symbols that you can download from online. Unfortunately, it's not available on iPad. Um, so you do need a Mac for this. Uh, let's see, um, check mark. Uh, if I search the word check, looks like we have a check mark dot circle. Um, uh, and we have check mark dot circle dot fail. I think this one looks more like a completed um, um, to do this item. So I'm going to copy that. And how do we include an image is by um, I guess we can use the plus button again to see what is available as an image. But if you want to take a guess, uh, I'll guess it's called image, right? We press enter. And we, again, let's see what are the kind of the arguments it needs. Um, so we have name and system name. So uh, for SF symbols, you do want to use this one called um, image parenthesis system name and provide it to the name of the symbol. We have checkmark.circle.fill. And let's take a look at what it looks like. Okay. It looks like they are vertically on top of each other. That's not exactly what I want. Uh, another thing, uh, in addition to adding views uh, to your screen, you most likely want to organize them in some ways. So for that, uh, we can do the plusing again, but I'm going to tell you it's something called stats, right? If you think about it, um, you are stacking things either on top or below each other or alongside each other. And if it's a vertical stack, it's called vStack. So if we add a vStack to it, you're going to see that it looks exactly the same because by default, I think it's kind of picked vStack for us. Uh, but we do want it to horizontally stack together. So let's change this to H stack and up to the view. We can see that they did change to. Uh, stack stack uh, horizontally next to each other, right? Okay. So this still looks a little bit um, um, of the wrong color, right? Uh, it's um, black, but most likely we want something like green. Uh, recall that we added modifier called foreground color before to change the text color. Similarly, we can change the foreground color to green by following the same syntax and um, using the kind of Xcode complete. And again, it did change the green box. Um, okay, so we have one to-do item now that um, doesn't exactly work. It's just a display. I guess so maybe the next thing I can think about is uh, when you click on that, you know, the check mark, it should toggle, right? If you haven't done it before, uh, it should uh, be not um, filled in. So for that, uh, it is our first time seeing something like an actual data in SwiftUI. So one important thing to remember in SwiftUI is that uh, you have some state, which is an fancy way of saying data. And you never change the UI directly, really, when you are running the app. Uh, how it happens is that you have some state. Your view will always automatically reflect that state. 
And when user performs some action that might change the UI, you don't really change the UI, you change the state and the UI will automatically update that. So for that, let's declare a variable in Swift. So uh, how you declare a variable in Swift is straightforward. You say the word var, right? And you give it a name, let's say is, is completed. And this thing is of type Boolean, which can be either true or false. And let's say by default, it is false. Now, uh, unfortunately, SwiftUI is not smart enough to understand that this is part of our state. So we need to say add state to inform SwiftUI that yes, this is part of my state. Whenever this variable changes, you should update my UI, okay? Um, what will be an UI elements that will update when user click on something? Uh, that is something we call button. Uh, I guess we can say maybe say action or uh, action doesn't really give us anything. If we say tap, no. I guess in that case, we really just need to scan through this. And luckily the first thing is called button. Uh, and we can say here, we kind of want to add the button here. If we double click on button, it adds the display kind of thing for us, but it doesn't really work uh, because we do want an image. So let's see, button add, add the opening parenthesis. So right now uh, we have um, view to display as kind of the label for the button. And in this case, we want this one called action label because everything else seems to require something called a string, which is just like a, uh, a bunch of character or sentence. And our display is an uh, actual image, not that. So we'll pick this one. Uh, I guess sometimes uh, learning something new will require you to look at Apple's official documentation. And we can take a look at that right now. If you go to help, you have every documentation here and search button. You're gonna see Apple's comprehensive guide on how to use this thing. And on Swift Playground, there is also a menu for this. Uh, you just need to, I think it's in the dot 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 menu and you can look up documentation or you can search online for this. And for today, I think I'm more uh, likely just gonna show you how to use it. Um, and so with Xcode, when you have, whenever you have this kind of autocomplete, you just press the key enter and it's gonna kind of autocomplete for you. So the first thing is uh, action. Let's not care about that for now, but let's move this image inside the curly braces. Uh, so the curly braces specify where a bunch of code ends and where it starts. So basically we're saying for the label of the button, it's gonna be um, this image. And for the action, when we tap on a button, uh, let's say uh, for a to-do this item, I think the most intuitive thing we want to do is that if it's already completed, we should set it to false, uh, otherwise set it to true. So that sounds like is completed equal to not is completed, right? I think this is some um, um, program paradigm that we have seen before. Now we do have an action that updates the state. Now we want the UI to always reflect what the state is. So we can uh, maybe add an if statement here, let's say if it's completed, uh, we're gonna display the, the image, otherwise we just display another image. Uh, but there is a simpler shorthand for that. Um, mm, I'm gonna write out the code for you to see kind of what if we, what will look like without this syntax sugar. Um, but there's an easier way to write that is just, if it's completed, then we're gonna do this question mark, uh, Sandy. So if it's completed, we use whatever is behind this question mark. Otherwise we use something else that's behind this colon. So this can be translated to is completed, question mark, colon. And I'm just gonna write one more dot to indicate the difference. And in this case, if it's not completed, we want to see a different image. Um, maybe let's go back to the SF symbols app and see, we have check mark circle fail. Sounds like we should be able to see something like a circle for empty one. So I'm just gonna copy the name for that and use circle here. Now, if we resume the uh, preview, we should be able to see that by default, it is the circle instead of a check mark now. And I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. And if we click on it, uh, it doesn't really work because this is preview. Um, if you want to be interactive, you need to click this plus, 
a play button if you're using Xcode for iPad, it will just work. Now you can click on this and it will actually change. Okay, so for user interactions, it will be using a button. Um, in the action, you change your state variable and in the display or the view or the label, whatever you call it, you should always reflect the state. You don't change the view directly, you change the state. Uh, and then we see that foreground color is a little bit off as well, right? When it's not completed, it should probably not be green. So we're gonna repeat the same process again, right? If it's completed, question mark, then it will be green. Otherwise, uh, let's just change it to indigo to match our text color. Um, so, great. Now we have some basic user interaction with our apps already. Uh, although it's just a single button that you can click, um, but still it's super fun, I think. Um, so um, I guess right now we already have one to do item to display. Um, maybe we want multiple of them, right? Sounds like a good plan. And if we recall from programming, uh, if we want to have multiple things, we'll want to have an array of things. Uh, let's say to do items is an array of, let's just start with string right now, I guess. And we can start with um, an array of things. I don't know. Learn Swift UI, submit for Swift Student Challenge, or some other to do um, items that I can think of. But if we see this um, kind of the syntax for this, uh, let is another way to specify variables, but those are variables that cannot change. So those are constants. And you can specify the type, which is array of strings. And you can give an initial value. You can put in them in brackets. Um, you can separate them with print, um, comma. And for strings, you put them in double quotes, similar to what you would be doing in other programming languages, I would say. All right. And if you're following along, you don't have to necessarily type the exact same to do these items as uh, I'm doing. Um, but um, really for Swift UI, uh, another thing is whenever you want to um, kind of iterate over an uh, array of things, Swift UI wanted to be identifiable. Um, that way you can tell, uh, let's say maybe you have two to-do list items that are exactly the same. Um, maybe you want to learn SwiftUI twice. Uh, SwiftUI want to be able to differentiate between the first learn SwiftUI task and the second one. And for that, uh, we'll need to introduce a different structure to store the data together with some sort of identifier. And I guess another thing we want to store together to do uh, uh, alongside the to-do list items is whether they are completed or not. So we kind of see that for each item, we want the text, the ID, and if it's completed. So for that, we're gonna introduce a new data structure to store that. I'm just gonna put them in the same uh, file. Well, actually not, let me show you how to create a new file. Uh, both on the Playground app or on Xcode, you can just do a new file. Um, and I'm just gonna call it to do item. And here we can start to declare our to do item definition. If you're familiar with other programming languages, most likely you want to start with class maybe to do item and curly braces and curly braces, but in Swift, uh, classes are uh, actually not really favored by the language um, because classes create a lot of trouble uh, when you have multiple of them. And you, you, um, it's an interesting topic we can discuss later, but for today, the most important takeaway uh, from classes is that whenever you want to write the word class, instead you write the word struct for structure. Um, it has a lot of benefits when you use struct with SwiftUI, so we highly encourage you to use this. And now we can define our variables in here as well. Uh, so we have the variable that uh, maybe the text of the to-do item is of type string, right? Uh, when we have again is completed, that will be bool as we have before. Uh, we can have an ID. Um, now, there's something in Swift like foundation called UUID. And 
I guess we don't really need a variable for ID. More likely we want a constant for ID. Once we create the item, we probably don't want to change it. So we just say ID is of type UID. And we're just gonna uh, make a UUID by calling the constructor using the parentheses. And uh, to let Swiftify know this thing does have an ID, you add this thing called colon identifiable after it. Um, if you're familiar with Java, this is basically conforming to um, interface, right? This thing implements an identifiable interface um, that has an ID in it. So this is the syntax for that in Swift. Now Swiftify is able to iterate over to do items. So let's go back. And instead of storing strings, let's store to-do items. Now to make a to-do item, just like any other class, uh, classes or structs, you see the name of the thing and parentheses. Xcode is gonna tell you what it needs. Uh, it's gonna need the text. It's completely is false and it doesn't need an ID, right? And we can repeat this for our other ones. I'm just going to copy the text over. And we no longer need this is completed um, thing anymore. Um, but we're going to gradually change this and not take all of them at once. So uh, to, uh, to display a bunch of items together, we use something else called a list. And I'm going to, just going to comment out that for now. And we're going to use that part of code later. So we can type in list, All right? Curly braces. And inside the list, we can use a for each structure to display an array of identifiables. And again, all of this can either be learned by following the Apple Sophia tutorial or online or with some other resources or just looking the add button. So for each, uh, we can see here, there are a bunch of um, things. So for each wants you to tell it what you for each on. So we want to, for each to-do list item inside our to-do items array, we're gonna display it. And each of the item, we're just gonna call it to-do item, right? And I guess the inside item is basically what we had before right here. Uh, the each stack, so I'm just going to copy that over and um, uh, have them in here. So I guess although it looks, uh, how did I fold that? Uh, that's very fun. Um, okay. Um, so I guess while this code works now, it's not going to display our array contents uh, because we haven't changed our code to accommodate for that. So this is basically like your normal for loop. Uh, it's that just your loop variables here called to do item. Uh, we can say to do item. Again, similar to other program languages, we see dot to access a property of that. We can say dot text, and it's gonna give us the text of that to do item. And as you can see here, all of them has been automatically updated to see the to do item. All right, pretty cool. Uh, now, we haven't really fixed the uh, uh, check marks any yet, right? All of them are still sharing the single state variable. That's not great. Um, so for that, we do want to make our to-do items a state and make it modifiable, so change it to a variable. And we no longer need this is completed. Right, so I guess most intuitively, we want to say to-do item dot is completed is not to-do uh, this is completed. Um, but Xcode is not exactly going to be happy about that because we're modifying the item. By default, Swift UI won't only updates UI when something's changed. So by default, it makes things not changeable. And to fix that, we'll use something called a uh, binding. Binding, as the name kind of suggests, it binds it to a source. Uh, so we can insert this magic dollar sign in front to get a binding of to-do items. And we add dollar sign in front of to-do item to make it a modifiable binding. And now we can change to-do item is completed to be nice. Um, why is that the case? Mm, that's fun. Mm -hmm.
this should work. Papa.tago. Okay, I guess I do need a different wheel. Um, yes, sorry. You um, As soon as it becomes a binding, it is modifiable again. Uh, you don't need to add the binding in front. Um, but yeah, uh, so that's how you make things editable from uh, somewhere else. Basically, you will make it a binding. And we can see an example of this later, but let's first uh, check that this indeed works, right? When we click on one item, it only changes that single one and not any other ones. Okay, cool. And just to show you a little bit more about binding, um, we have this text here. I guess it would be great if we can just modify the text on the go here as well. So for that, uh, let's search uh, input, no. Uh, text, we have something else called text field, which allows uh, users to edit text. So why don't we try that uh, to do content or be the default. And for value, because again, if something else want to edit something, we'll need a binding. So we see binding of dollar sign to do item dot text. Now text field has a way to bind to our to-do items text and I'll, I'll automatically update it. So if we resume, uh, I guess text field doesn't really allow you to specify the font weight. Let's try that. Does it do that? I guess text field doesn't allow you to specify the font. Uh, that sucks. Well, anyways, um, sometimes that happens, but it is fine. I guess we just don't specify font weight and let the text field handle what's best for it. And now we can see that we have a cursor here and we can update the text, right? And all of them still work independently. You can still click on the buttons. Um, yes, that's how you will be updating data. When something uh, asks you for a binding, uh, you add the dollar sign. Let's say if you don't give a binding, Xcode will be unhappy telling you it wants a binding. So whenever that happens, you add the dollar sign in front and should be happy again. Um, yes, it should be happy again. All right. So looks like most of our to-do list app is in place. Um, one thing that we probably want is to have a title for this. And for that, you use something called navigation view, which is also something that will allow you to kind of go between pages on your app. Right, if you have apps have multiple pages uh, that are kind of nested on top of each other, let's say the settings app, right? You have the top level settings. If you go into Wi Fi, now you see another view that you can pick which Wi Fi to connect to. So that's an example of navigation view. And we can put this entire list inside the navigation view. I'm just going to format the text a little bit to make it look better. Um, you're gonna see that this thing gets lowered down a little bit because now it's expecting a title for the thing. And we can add a navigation title for this. That's this to do. Uh, I don't understand why my Xcode is not automatically updating, but it should. Now we have a, a large title for to-dos. And our fancy to-do this app is working great. Um, but I guess uh, I, I said that for navigation view, the best thing is that you can push and pop. Um, so I guess we can, um, uh, I guess when you tap on each row, why don't we go to a different screen? So we can use something else called navigation link. I guess uh, I'm just adding a bunch of different weird stuff uh, right now that you probably don't know they exist if you're just starting to develop. For that, I guess one thing you can do is ask our Discord server, say, hey, I want to implement this feature. What would be the thing for me to use? Or you can Google it online. Most likely you will find an answer uh, for that. So navigation link, we can see that we have destination and label. Uh, again, pressing the enter key while it's doing that. So I guess for the label, it's exactly the same view as what we have right now, right? Um, and for the destination, uh, uh, I guess let's just do another thing that kind of works like text fail, but it's like a full screen one that's text editor. And again, we can see that auto completes as he expects a binding. 
And we already know how to do that, right? It's to do items text. And for that, if we resume our app, we can see that once we click on one, it takes us to the second screen that has more, uh, more room for us to type the text than this screen. And again, because it's inside navigation view, we can add a title to it. Um, we can call it maybe details. If we resume and going there again, we get the new title on the screen. Uh, looks like it's a little too close to the edge. Why don't we add a little bit of padding to this? Now we have a little more padding to it. So I think with Swift UI, it is very easy to create some basic user interfaces. Uh, and, and the real important part is think of our user interactions. Um, uh, I don't know what would be a good example. Let's say uh, we maybe want to, um, Hmm, what would be a good one? Um, I guess well, um, there are a bunch of interactions you can add to views. Uh, let's say, let's add uh, on this um, text, uh, let's add this, on, this H stack. And we can see that um, uh, there are a lot of modifiers we can choose from. And I guess, why don't we do on, um, Tap gesture. If we tap it three times, we're gonna print hi. Okay, this is our first time seeing how to print. Yes, it's pretty simple. Just say the word print, it prints. And if we tap on this three time, I guess it doesn't really allow us to do that because we have a view. Uh, I guess let's add it to somewhere else. All right, let's add it to here so we can actually tap on it. And we should see the word high being printed somewhere now. I guess it's also because, uh, all right, let's try to move it out. So that way the entire view should be tappable. Unfortunately, we're tapping on something that is being nested inside somewhere else. So this thing will be a little hard to do, right? Mm. Yeah, I guess sometimes the tap gesture doesn't work great with everything else, but let's say if we uh, change this to maybe not something that can handle ta uh, tapping gesture, let's just change it to a normal text um, that way. Um, that way we can just add it on the text like that. Uh, and it's not gonna consume it. So hopefully we can. See the tap gesture happening in real time. Oh, it really doesn't want to print high for me, I guess. Uh, Lucas, do you think this is because I didn't run the app? Um, yeah, I think one of the reasons that this is not happening is probably because um, I'm not running an app and some things that um, might only happen if you run the app. So let's try this. Uh, all right. Again, we can see that the user interface should look exactly the same, but you are going to get more interactions if you actually run the app than just using the preview. Yeah, right now we can actually see it now. So uh, if you have some things that you expected to work, but not most likely it's because you're inside preview and you do need to run the app to see it actually working. And this, this is especially true if you're using features like camera because only the real device have it, not the simulator, not the preview. So yeah. With that, I think we're about time. Um, so hopefully I have demonstrated some basics in terms of uh, how to write some basic code in SwiftUI. Maybe how to use this plus button to look for things, uh, how to maybe look at Apple's official documentation and see uh, how to maybe use some things. And here I'm gonna have a few more resources for you to view, All right? Um, uh, so first, for those of you who are more familiar with UIKit and have used Storyboard before, this is a code snippet that allows you to bring in Storyboard files into your Swift Playgrounds app. I would recommend finish up making your play, uh, uh, Storyboard inside a normal project first, 
because playgrounds doesn't really have a very good support for uh, editing playground or it doesn't really even allow you to add the file directly you need to drag it from another uh, folder uh, so once you're done with that you can add this piece of code in your surf ui basically we make a struct and it conforms to the ui view controller representable uh, interface or protocol so anytime if you are wanting to use some other frameworks that's not directly available in surf ui either it's ARKit, ReactKit, or UIKit. You'll use this UI view controller representable, or if it's a view, let's say AR view, you'll use UI view representable, and follow the code uh, suggestions from Xcode and um, fill it in. But basically in the make function, you will make either the view or the view controller. And if you're using storyboard, it is this code here that creates a storyboard of the given name and returns the first controller in there. And in the Swift UI code, where we type like the text or maybe image, you will type storyboard, name, main, and it's gonna load the contents of the main storyboard. All right. And some other links, we're gonna publish the slides immediately after uh, this thing ends. Hopefully you are in our um, app dev Discord server. Uh, if not, please join soon. Um, and you can visit uh, the Apple's website to see some of the other sample apps that's also including the Swift Playgrounds app. Um, and on ha Hacking with Swift, you can find a lot of interesting things as well. If you want to get started learning how to program in Swift UI, we have a guide on our website that kind of provides you some guides. Uh, there's one WC video that's especially good uh, that kind of works you through a more comprehensive example of Swift UI code. Uh, it's UW app dev slash resources slash getting that started slash Swift UI. And uh, for our own app, uh, club, we also have some of our own apps that you can try out on Swift Playgrounds. Uh, you can go to Swift Playground gallery slash UW app dev to see our available Swift Playground apps. And there is a worldwide Q&A created by Apple China uh, that people kind of ask their questions on there. So. Uh, there are English questions, there are Chinese questions. So no matter which one you prefer, you can ask those questions here. And that will be it for today's workshop. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, on social media, we're at UW App Dev. Uh, otherwise, please join our Discord server, UW App Dev slash Discord. Um, and with that, any questions before I end the recording? Okay. That sounds like a no. Um, now I will be stop the recording.